Hi guys, this is Mrs. Foy, and this is going to be a lecture on chapter 14, which is about genetics. Um, and so this is in the Pearson book for AP Bio, and um, genetics is really exciting. Um, and so I hope that you um, enjoy this lecture. So you have to talk about this monk in the 1800s named Gregor Mendel. And this picture always cracks me up because you can tell where he is. He's right here um, looking at a pea plant. And what's really interesting about Gregor Mendel is that um, he really was um, not really so much a science person as he was a math person. And he was very strong in statistics. And his work on genetics was really lost over the ages um, um, until um, the uh, science community kind of caught up with him and his paper was rediscovered. And he was given credit for the person who um, is the, um, had the scientific evidence to back up this idea of a gene. And so that's where we're going to start. Now, in order to understand um, Gregor Mendel's model of his organism that he used, he used plants. And so um, you remember we were talking about in sexual life cycles that plants have this alternation of generation between a sporophyte and a gametophyte. So this is a gametophyte, this is a flower. And it has male and female, um, parts that produce uh, gam male and female gametes. So the male part of a flower is called the stamen, and it is uh, includes the anther and the filament. And the anther is where the pollen is produced, and that's the male gamete. And then this thing right here that looks kind of like a baseball bat is called a carpal. It's also called a pistil. And it has three parts, a sticky stigma, and then a stalk called a style, and then an ovary down here where the ovule or egg is produced. And so um, you do need to know the parts of a plant. Um, and that's important to know before we start talking about what Gregor Mendel did with um, with his plants. But just to kind of show you um, what a fruit is, right? So a fruit is, is, a, is a swollen, um, fertilized ovary. And um, sometimes depending on the um, method of propagation of, 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 of plant children, which is in a seed, right? Sometimes what plants will do is they will produce a juicy, sweet, um, ripened ovary so that um, animals will eat it and will help disperse their young. So I just wanted to show you, here is a, an apple flower, here is the ovary, and fertilization has occurred in this ovary. And actually in an apple, it's the ovary and the receptacle, this other part of the plant that gets ripened. And, um, and that, uh, that ripening and sweetening helps for its propagation uh, to be utilized by animals that eat it. So um, I have a couple pear shares in here uh, in, this, um, in this presentation. So if you're with somebody, you can uh, talk about these things back and forth with each other. Um, and if not, you might wanna pause the video and make sure that you can sketch a basic male and female parts of a flower and be able to label them. So pea plants, um, it was very serendipitous that Mendel chose the pea plant, but it was really um, very, very smart, uh, uh, just lucky, serendipitous that he did, but it, it actually helped him be able to see um, the, the workings of a gene in this plant. So here is the, um, the stigma and the, um, the style of the um, of the pea plant flower, here is the ovule, and here a a fruit is the actual um, seed pod, 
And these are the seeds, right? So the embryo is in that seed. And so a fruit doesn't always have to be like a, an apple or an orange. In this case, um, a fruit is the actual seed pod of a pea. So why was this such a, such a great choice and such a serendipitous choice? Well, one of the things is that there are very specific characteristics in a pea plant, like flower color, seed um, color, the height of the plant, um, the characteristic of the seed pod. And there were different uh, character variants, right? So blue, I mean blue, purple, white were the flowers, tall, short was the plant. Um, he could control the mating of the plant because he would cut off, as we'll see, part of the, um, the male um, reproductive part of the plant, and then he could pollinate himself. Um, and then he could cross pollinate. Um, by taking fertilizations from one plant to another. And so what he did was he actually would take the parental generation um, and the parental generation, he could actually cut off the, um, the male part of that. And then he could take the pollen from another uh, true breeding, uh, pure um, culture that he did after um, uh, reproducing white seeds over generation after generation and producing parent seeds after generation after generation, these purple. So we knew he had a purebred stock. And then he would take the pollen from one with a little brush. This is basically what bees do, right? And then he could um, cross fertilize um, his other plant. And so then the um, the F generation, filial, is what, is, is what we call F. So we can have an F1, which is the first filial generation, or F2, which is the second. And so what Mendel did was he would have these true breeding varieties, which were basically like purebred, right? So he knew over generations that they were just producing purple flowers or just producing white flowers. And then he would hybridize them. Right, so he would take one true breeding stock and cross fertilize it with another true breeding stock and to produce the F1 generation. Um, and then the F2 generation, he let those individuals self pollinize. So he could put like a little bag around them. And with some plants, this is the way they work is they can actually, the pollen from the male part of the flower can pollinate um, which produces the sperm, the pollen actually contains the sperm for the female part of the plant. And so when he did this, um, he saw a very interesting characteristic. He saw that in the F1 generation, all of the plants of these, um, the true breeding parent generation, the P generation, were all um, they were all hybrids, remember, because they were a cross of the two parent um, true breeding generations, but they were all purple. And then in the next generation, when he allowed the F1 generation to pollinate itself, he got a very specific, over time and time again, he recognized he was getting basically three times as many purple flowers as he was white. And so that led him to some pretty amazing conclusions. Now, one of the things that's so serendipitous about a pea plant is that Mendel looked at seven different traits that you can see them listed here. And guess how many chromosomes a pea plant has? Seven. And as it turns out, the alleles or the variation of the genes for each of these characteristics was on each individual chromosome. So they were not being inherited together. Otherwise, he wouldn't have got this really cool ratio that he used to figure out how genes work. Because I guess I should say, back in the day, um, people used to think that genes um, from, from parents were blended right? So if you had a black horse and you had a white horse and you bred those horses, you would get a gray horse. Um, 
And, you know, sometimes that seemed to work and sometimes it didn't work, but people were holding on to that idea that traits from the mother and traits from the father just kind of blended. And so Mendel was the first one to prove with scientific data that that is not the case. So at this point, you should be able to review P1, F1, and F2 generation. Why was the P plant a serendipitous choice for Mendel? And how did he hybridize? So as a result of these experiments that Mendel did, he came up with these, what we call Mendel's laws or Mendel's concepts. And I'm gonna go through them today because they are at the basis of every genetic student's understanding, okay? The first one is, is that there are alternate versions of genes and we call those alleles. So for example, there is a gene for flower color, but there are two different variations of that in pea plants. One is the gene for purple flowers and one is the gene for white flowers. And so we call those different variations alleles and they reside at a specific locus or per per particular part um, section of the chromosome. So here we have a pair of homologous chromosomes. Remember chromosomes for sexual reproducing organisms always come in pairs. And here we have the loci for the allele for purple flower and the allele for white flower. Mendel's other concept was for each characteristic, an organism always inherits, inherits two alleles. And one of these is from each parent, right? So he made this deduction, which is so interesting. He made this dedu deduction without really knowing the roles of chromosomes. He did it because he saw the statistical ratios that kept coming up and he made that leap in his mind. Well, this must be why. And that is because is that um, offspring are always inheriting two alleles from the parents. Um, and they can be identical, like they were in the true breeding plants where he was just breeding purple flowers and white flowers, or they can be different. If they're different, we call them a hybrid, okay? We call them a hybrid if they are different, two different alleles for the same gene. Mendel's third concept is that if two alleles are different, okay, so two alleles at the same loci are different, and one could be dominant and one could be recessive. So what he said is, is that the dominant allele would determine the organism's appearance, but the recessive allele, even though it's there, it would have no noticeable effect on the appearance. So I hope by now you have watched um, Dan Anderson or Bozeman Biology's um, great video about uh, the introduction to genetics and this idea of dominance. And he uses socks to show uh, homologous pairs. And the way that he showed dominance was he had one pair of one sock kind of balled up in another sock. It was there but you couldn't see what color it was because it was balled up in the other sock that was the dominant sock. So we're going to have some vocabulary words now that you need to know. Homozygous versus heterozygous. Homozygous means the two alleles are the same. Heterozygous means the two alleles are different. And dominant means that the allele is going to determine the organism's appearance while a recessive allele does not have a noticeable effect on the appearance if the dominant allele is around. You would have to have two recessive alleles for it to affect the appearance of the organism. Mendel's concept number four is the law of segregation. And so basically what he says, now remember he knew nothing about meiosis or mitosis, okay? But he said that in the law of segregation, the alleles are going to segregate during um, gamete formation, right? So when a male makes gametes, when a male makes sperm, the two homologous chromosomes that have alleles on the same loci are gonna separate. And the same thing in a female producing her gamete, which is the egg. So 
an egg or a sperm then only gets one copy of the allele because they segregated in meiosis. And so that's really important, right? That segregation we know occurs doing meiosis one of gamete formation, either oogenesis or spermatogenesis. But of course, Mendel didn't know this, which is really so cool that he figured this out all based on deduction and scientific evidence from his statistics. So here's a quick little two minute video that is going to review for you the steps of meiosis. Gregor Mendel developed the law of segregation while studying the traits of pea plants. After exploring generations of parents and offspring, looking at specific traits, he was surprised to find some common rules, now known as the laws of genetics, which govern how all traits are passed from parents to offspring. When Mendel took a purple flower plant and crossed it with a white flower plant, all of the offspring had purple flowers. When he bred the two of these offspring with one another, most of their offspring were purple. However, there were a few white flower plants as well. Now let's look at how this happened. Mendel believed that the parents, the purple flower plant and the white flower plant, each gave one factor to the offspring. Therefore, the offspring had one purple factor and one white factor. However, as purple is dominant to the white, all the offspring appear purple. When the cell of the offspring underwent meiosis, its factors divided or were segregated into four different gamete cells. One purple and another purple. One white and another white. Therefore, when the offspring were created, there were various combinations. Two purple factors could combine to create a purple flower, or one purple and one white could combine to create a purple flower, or one white and one purple could combine to create a purple flower, or two whites could combine to create a white flower. Based on these results, what did Mendel think? From these results, he developed his law of segregation. The law of segregation states that when gametes, either egg or sperm, are formed, the two factors in the parent cell are divided into separate gamete cells. Created using Paltoon. All right, awesome. So one of the things I hope you recognize there is that the um, that Mendel did not use the word gene; he used the word factor. So that's really important to know. So basically, um, you remember this from your freshman year in biology. So let's, um, we're going to talk about the difference between genotype and phenotype now, okay? So phenotype is the physical expression. So phenotype physical, all right? And genotype is the combination of the genes. So here we have the genotype of a, of a true bred purple flower, the genotype of a true bred white flower. We would call this homozygous dominant because it has two alleles that are the same and they're both dominant. We would call this genotype homozygous recessive. And so homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive. And so, here we see the law of segregation that only one of these P's, one of these alleles gets into the gamete, only one of these alleles gets into the gamete. And then in the F1 generation, which is a hybrid generation, we see the genotype, which is big P, little p. And that is a heterozygous genotype. But notice because of the law of dominance, we still have purple flowers because the dominant allele is having its expression on the physical um, appearance of the flower. And so then to figure out what the um, law of segregation would determine for the F2 generation if they were allowed to, um, if, if they were allowed to breed together, we do this thing called a Punnett square. And so we take in the sperm, we take there's a half a chance that, that the big P could end up in the sperm or the little P 
Same thing with the eggs. We got a half a chance that the big P allele could end up in the egg or the little P allele. And so then we fill in these different chances of fertilizations and we get this thing called a Punnett square. And this is for a mono hybrid cross. Mono means one, hybrid is the white flower and the, the purple flower. And so what we see here is we see a ratio. If you look at this, um, if you look at this Punnett square, I see three out of the four are purple phenotypes and one out of the of the four is white. And so that three to one ratio is always what you're going to get when you have two, um, when you have a heter two heterozygous parents following um, Mendel, regular Mendel genetics, which does not mean that any of the, the alleles are linked. So if they're on separate chromosomes, that's what you would get. So we've talked about homozygous and heterozygous. And if you have a heterozygous um, individual, then that's not going to be true breeding, right? Because if they, if they, um, if they breed together, then you're, you're going to get that three to one ratio if it is a monohybrid cross. So here we go. Here is the phenotypic ratio that we see from two heterozygous individuals is three to one. The genotypic ratio we see is one to two to one. So we have one chance out of four of getting homozygous dominant, two chances out of getting uh, heterozygous, um, big P, little p, or technically little p, big P. But in a genotype, we always write the dominant one first. So that's why they look there like they're the same. And then one chance out of four to get homozygous recessive. So how do you know if you see an individual that's a purple flower? How do you know what the genotype is? You don't know. The only way that you can figure it out is to do something called a test cross. And so what you do is you cross that unknown genotype flower with something that you know. And what do you always know? You always know the recessive. You always know the homozygous recessive. And so when he crossed that with a um, homozygous recessive white flower, then he could figure out, well, if the purple flower was homozygous dominant, all of the offspring would be purple flowers. If the other purple flower was heterozygous, then you would get a um, you would get a two out of four or 50-50 um, combination between purple flowers and white flowers. So remember that test cross technique because that's really important in genetics. So remember a monohybrid cross is just looking at a single character, right? It's just looking at one particular trait. So that's really important because we're going to see in a minute, if you look at more than one, there, there's a different law involved. And that other law we're talking about is the law of independent assortment, which states that different pairs of alleles are going to segregate independently of each other during meiosis, during gamete formation. And so that law only applies if the particular alleles are on separate chromosomes right? If they're on the same chromosome, then we say they're linked, and then they do not follow the law of independent assortment. So you have to look at two different traits to see the law of independent assortment in action during meiosis. And so what Mendel called um, these, uh, in order to see the law of independent assortment in action, he had to produce dihybrids. So he had to produce individuals that had two different traits. And again, he was lucky, right? That the, um, all, of the, all of these characteristics that he was looking at were um, determined by individual chromosomes in a pea plant. Otherwise, he wouldn't have got these, right? If they're linked, then they're, they're not going to have the same um, result. So here's a, a little short two-minute video to review this for you. 
Mendel's law of independent assortment. What happens when pea plants of two different traits are bred with each other? Let's consider a hypothetical situation. We cross a plant producing round and yellow seeds with a plant producing wrinkled green seeds. The inheritance of two such characters is known as dihybrid inheritance. The entire F1 progeny produces round and yellow seeds. In such a case, round and yellow seeds would be the dominant traits. The next step is to self-pollinate the F1 generation. Mendel found that some plants of the F2 progeny were similar to their parents and produced round yellow seeds and some of them produced wrinkled green seeds. However, some plants of the F2 progeny even showed new combinations like round, green and wrinkled yellow seeds. Therefore, it can be safely concluded that the round or wrinkled trait and the yellow or green colored traits are independently inherited and they are known as recombinants. Mendel observed that the progeny included nine round and yellow seeds, three round and green seeds, three wrinkled and yellow seeds, and one wrinkled and green seed. Therefore, he gave his third law. Law of independent assortment states that when two or more characteristics are inherited, individual heredity factors assort independently during gamete production. So what we see there is again, his amazing ability with statistics. When he did a dihybrid cross of two heterozygous parents, he always got the same ratio, this nine to three to three to one of the phenotypic ratio. The nine out of the 16 different possibilities was the dominant dominant, in this case, round and yellow. The one was the recessive recessive. So that would be wrinkled and green. But then he got three yellow wrinkled and three green round. And so the three out of 16 cho cho chances of each of those um, showed that these must, the, the gene for the, the round versus wrinkled and the gene of the green versus yellow had to be assorted independently during meiosis. So you might wanna pause this and make sure that you can go back through and um, summarize Mendel's five important concepts. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about doing some genetic problems. The College Board used to have a lot of genetic problems, which was very difficult, and now they really don't as much. But there are two major laws of statistics that you need to know for genetics. One of them is the multiplication rule and the other one is the addition rule, all right? So the multiplication rule states that the probability of two independent events occurring together at the same time would be a multiplication of their two probabilities, all right? So for example, if you want to know um, if a, a segregation of a heterozygous plant, okay, if it's going to be a dominant or a recessive uh, allele that gets to the offspring, each gamete has a half a chance, right, of getting the dominant versus a half a chance of getting the recessive. And so if you want to know what the choices, the chances are of getting both of those, you would multiply those two chances together. So the outcome of one segregation does not impact the law the, the outcome of the other. Just like if I flip a heads with a coin, it does not affect the outcome of my next flip. I'm still gonna have a 50-50 chance. And so in that is the same way 
with alleles segregating independently. So this is what we're talking about here. If I flip a coin, right, my law of segregation, I have a 50-50 chance, half a chance of getting heads, half a chance of getting tails, again for the egg, half a chance of getting heads, half a chance of getting tails. But what is my probability of getting two heads? It's one out of four. What is my probability of getting a, a, a head and a tail? One out of four. What is my probability of getting a tail and a head? That's also one out of four. And what is my probability of getting two tails? That would also be one fourth. So what is the chance that you will roll a two and a five? Okay, so and is your Q to use the multiplication rule. All right, that's my little tip for you. So what is the chance of rolling a two? It's going to be one out of six for a six-sided dice. What is the chance of rolling a five? That would also be a one out of six chance. So what is the chance that if you're rolling two dice at the same time, you're going to get a two and a five? That would be one six times one six, which is one out of 36. Now, listen how this question is different. What is the chance you will roll a two or a five? Or in statistics means that you are going to add. So if my chance of rolling a two is one out of six and my chance of rolling a five is one out of six, what is my chance of rolling a two or a five is going to be one six plus one six, which is two out of six or one third. So we can use the rule of multiplicity in genetics problems, all right? So here is a tri-hybrid cross, all right? And um, this would be impossible to do with a Punnett square, all right? So my suggestion is that you do three little mini monohybrid Punnett squares and then multiply each probability, right? So I have got a parent who is um, heterozygous for all three traits. And then I have another parent who is heterozygous for the A trait, but homozygous dominant for B and homozygous dominant for C. So what is the chance of getting a, a, a heterozygous offspring for all three traits if you have those parents? So what you need to do is you're gonna do a little monohybrid cross for each of the um, different uh, traits, for the A trait, the B trait, and the C trait. So you could get big A, big A, you could big A, little A, you could get little A, big A, and you could get little A, little A, okay? And so um, each of those, how many of those possibilities, how many of these four possibilities one, two, three, four, is heterozygous, right? Because that's the question that's asking me, heterozygous. So it's two out of those four, right? It's this one and this one. So two out of the four possibilities um, is just for the A part of this problem. So then I would do the same thing for the Bs and the same thing for the Cs. And because I'm asking for A and B and C, right? I need all three of these. I'm gonna multiply those separate probabilities and that would be a half times a half times a half or one eighth. So the answer is if you have this parent um, breeding with this parent's genotype, what are the chances of getting big A, little A, big B, little B, big C, little C, right? the chances are one out of eight. The rule, out of a, the rule of addition states that the probability of any one or two or more exclusive events, or, see the word or in that problem, is by adding together their individual probabilities. So if you see the word or in a problem, then you know you're gonna use addition. All right, so here's another problem. So it says, if the parents are, and then it gives this genotype for this particular um, tri-hybrid cross, right? 
what is the fraction of the offspring from this cross that are predicted to show at least two recessive traits? Okay, so the way that you could restate this says or, right? So you're saying, could I get this genotype or this genotype or, and then you would have to go through and get the other ones. And there are actually 12 different possibilities that you could get. Of all the potential genotypes, only this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one show at least two recessive traits, right? Because they've got two um, of the um, homozygous recessive genotypes for that trait. So then what you're going to do is you're going to calculate the probability of getting each of these different genotypes, and then you're going to add those together. All right, you're gonna add those together. So the chance of getting at least two recessive traits, which of course would include the possibility of getting three recessive, which is what this genotype is, you add all of these different events and that would be your answer for this problem because it's asking for or. So problem A, I've got problem A and problem B here. I, would highly suggest that you pause the video and try to do these problems and then you can check yourself on the next slide. So the answer to problem A is one out of 32 and the answer to problem B um, when you have to add up the probabilities is one half. So hopefully you got those right. So extending Mendelian genetics for a single gene. So Sometimes you have an inheritance of a single gene that does not follow Mendel's patterns, okay? And so you have three different situations where that happens. Number one, the alleles are not completely dominant or recessive. Another situation is where you have a gene that has more than two alleles. Or number three, when you have a gene that produces multiple phenotypes, and that's called pleiotrophy, and we'll talk about that later. So complete dominance occurs when you have a phenotype of heterozygous and uh, when you have a phenotype of a heterozygous and a dominant homozygous dominant that are the same, like a purple flower. You don't know when you look at a purple flower if it's heterozygous genotype or homozygous dominant. But sometimes you have a situation where you have incomplete dominance and the hybrids would show a phenotype that was somewhere in between the two parental varieties. And then in other cases, you have a co-dominant situation where you have both dominant alleles um, that are expressing in the phenotype. So here's an example of incomplete dominance in a snapdragon color, right? So if you have a red parent, for color, right? So this is the red allele for color and the white allele for color. And you had gametes that produces this um, heterozygous offspring. Notice that the phenotype is pink. So it's halfway in between the two um, parents. And if you see that, then you know you have incomplete dominance. And you could see that in my cross here, I would have a two out of four chance of getting a pink flower, a one out of four chance of getting a red flower, or a one out of four chance of getting a white flower. The example of codominance, um, a good hip pocket example, is the ABO blood system. So we actually have here um, an allele for the A antigen, which is a protein on the red blood cell surface, and for the B antigen of, uh, on the red blood cell surface. And then we also have a situation where we don't have any of that particular type of antigen. So this would be an example of codominance because when you have the expression of the A, a protein and the B protein um, for uh, a red blood cell surface, you would have type AB blood. So pause the video for a second, take a look at this flower, and then say to yourself, 
is this phenotype due to complete dominance, incomplete dominance, codominance, and why? So pause the video and see if you can answer the question. And hopefully you got that the answer is going to be not incomplete dominance because you would have had an in-between, like some kind of pink or maroon color. Um, and it isn't complete dominance because there's two colors. So this is an example of co-dominance, where the white and the red are both um, equally dominant. So what is the relationship between dominant and recessive alleles really? It's not like they duke it out in your body and one of them's dominant, right? So remember that alleles are simply variations of the gene's nucleotide sequence, right? It's just a, a variation um, in the code, in the gene. And so depending on which level of the organization you look at, the relationship of the alleles is going to be different. So this is really hard for students to understand. So um, hopefully you'll really focus on this and try to understand this. So Tay-Sachs is a fatal genetic disorder. Um, it is a dysfunctional version of an enzyme that causes an accumulation of lipids in the brain and, um, and it is, um, it's, it's, it's fatal. It's a very um, sad um, situation. But at the organismal level for, heteros for a heterozygous individual, okay, that means it has one copy of each, the allele is recessive, okay? Because if you had a heterozygous individual for this particular disease, they would be healthy they would not have the disease at the organismal level. Either you have Tay-Sachs or you don't. At the biochemical level, right, the phenotype is incomplete dominance. If you look at the enzyme level, if you look at the idea that of, of, of how much of this enzyme is there, it would be a medium amount, right? If you had a heterozygous individual because some of this particular enzyme would be made with the normal coding for the enzyme, and some of the enzyme amount would be made with the defective Tay-Sachs enzyme. But at the biochemical level, if I measured the amounts, I would have both. But at the molecular level, well, I guess I should go back to the biochemical level there is enough of the normal healthy enzyme that the person would not have the accumulation of the lipids in their brain. So they wouldn't have taste sacs. At the molecular level, both alleles are codominant, you can think, because the taste sac allele is going to code for making an enzyme that is defective. And the normal allele for that enzyme is going to make a regular enzyme that works. So it kind of depends on which level you're talking about when you talk about um, dominance versus recessive. It's, it's actually more complicated than what you think. So frequency of dominant alleles, right? So if in a, in a dominant uh, allele situation, if you have one copy of that, then it's going to be expressed in your phenotype. And so you would think that dominant alleles would be more frequent, but they're not, okay? So for example, there is something called polydactyly, where you can have more than one, more than five fingers or toes. And only one baby out of 400 in the United States is born with an extra finger or toe. And so think of it this way. If it's dominant, why isn't it more frequent? Well, it's because there's only so many, only so many dominant genes in the gene pool right? If you take all of the genes for polydactyly and all of the genes for regular digit number in, in your uh, regular digit numbers and you put those in a big bucket, there's only going to be so many of the dominant genes in the gene pool. The only way that would change is, is because of evolution. So that's why dominant alleles um, aren't more and more frequent. So multiple alleles, right? So we've talked about this. This is an example of um, blood types. And this is a great hip pocket example for multiple alleles. So capital I is used for either the allele for A blood or B blood. 
right? And here's the these little um, antigens on the surface. And little i, little i, is the allele that we're um, for no antigen on the surface. So you can see the the codominant um, situation that we have here, but this is multiple alleles. Pleiotropy is a situation where you have one gene that it can, can affect more than one trait. Okay, so many genes have multiple, multiple phenotypic effects, and that's called pleiotropy. So I'm going to give you some examples, but we can see these in genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis and sickle cell D disease. So for example, in sickle cell, right, we have um, a hemoglobin, a, a gene for hemoglobin that is defective from one amino acid mutation in the DNA. And we have this hemoglobin that is abnormal. And so uh, it tends to crystallize in the red blood cell and that makes the shape of the red blood cell um, abnormal. It makes the sickle shape, shape because of the defective hemoglobin protein, right? And so that causes a multitude of effects, breakdown of red blood, cell, blood cells, clumping or clogging of small uh, blood vessels, accumulation of these sickle cells in the spleen. And so that determines uh, all of these other symptoms and then all of these effects like kidney failure um, um, and some impaired circulation, um, and uh, uh, pain, um, and so that would be an example of a pleiotropic effect. Another example is albinism, okay? So if you have uh, no pigment in your eyes or your skin, then there are multiple effects that that can have. Another different uh, vocabulary where we need to know in genetics is this, is I this idea of epistasis. Epi means above. And we're going to learn a lot more about this, but sometimes one gene can influence the effect of another gene. So here in this diagram, we say that gene B is epistatic to gene A. So in other words, it's going to affect the expression of whatever gene A codes for. So in epistatic gene interaction, we can see this a lot with um, pigment. All right, that's a good hip pocket example. So here we have two different enzymes. We have enzyme C and enzyme P, and they would be coded for by two different genes. So if you have this genotype where you have at least one copy of the dominant gene, you get a colorless precursor from this enzyme. But then if you have the other gene for, ends for enzyme P, if you have at least one dominant of that, then that is going to affect the, ap the actual deposition of that pigment in that particular organism. And so that is how we would get like a purple pigment. Um, anthocyanin is, is, a, is a purple pigment that we're gonna talk about later in my class when we do a lab on fast plants. So in epistasis, you have one gene at a different location that's going to affect the expression of another gene. And as I said, this is very common in mammals with coat color, right? So coat color in mice and some other mammals like dogs depends on two different genes. We have an allele for black and brown that we're gonna use the Bs for. And then we have another gene that we say is allele C for color or no color that's going to determine if the pigment is going to be deposited or not. So here we have an example of one of my favorite dogs, the lab. And you can see that in this case, it's talking about, it's actually using the letter E for the color deposition. But here in a yellow lab, um, I don't have, I have a, a double recessive here. Here, um, I have, I do not have, I don't have the color deposition gene for, uh, that's, it's recessive. And so even though I have 
a, um, a big B here, the only place it's going to be deposited is in the nose and the lips and the eye rims of the dog. If I have a if I have a dominant allele for the actual pigment deposition, then I can see different color um, pigments being deposited in the hair and other places on the dog. This is how you get a black lab. This is how you get a chocolate lab and uh, the two different versions of the yellow lab. And so this is uh, a different type of uh, statistical inheritance pattern. Notice that this looks like a dihybrid cross, doesn't it? I've got four different possibility of gametes here and here, and I have 16 different possibilities, but I did not get nine to three to three to one, did I? And that is a clue for you as a genetics student that that is not going to be normal inheritance. That's probably going to be some type of epistasis event. Again, here is mice, all right? And here we're using big C for the color deposition gene and then the B gene for either brown or black. So again, I, it looks like I have a dihybrid cross, but I do not get a, a dihybrid cross of two heterozygous parents, I guess I should say, right? So these parents are heterozygous, but I did not get a nine to three to three to one. And therefore I know that this is going to be a, a type of non-Mendelian inheritance, probably epistasis. We also have a situation called polygenetic inheritance. Polygenetic, it just, the word means what it says, more than one gene are going to be affecting uh, the trait, all right? And skin color, height, eye color, and hair color are all examples of polygenetic inheritance. A key characteristic of polygenetic inheritance would be a gradation in the phenotypes, okay? So kind of like a blending of the traits. Now, again, we went through a whole lot of Mendelian genetics to realize that in most inheritance, we're not talking about the blending of, of, of traits. But in this particular situation with polygenetic inheritance, we do have a kind of blending. Um, and skin color is such as an interesting phenomenon. Um, skin color is basically dependent upon a wonderful molecule called melanin. And melanin comes in two different forms, the theliomelanin and eumelanin. The theliomelanin comes in a red-yellow um, variety, and the eumelanin comes in a brown-black. And so, um, we, we know that um, a red-haired, freckled, fair-skinned person is going to have a, a mutation that has lots of pheomelanin and very little of the eumelanin. Polygenetic inheritance is also seen in eye color. And even though it's true that dark eyes are dominant over non-dark eyes, um, there is more than one gene that's being affected. So if you learn that blue eyes are recessive to dark eyes, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Like we have green eyes, we have hazel eyes, right? And so we know that that is a polygenetic inheritance. It's not going to be the normal Mendelian genetics. Um, we usually think of this as a quantitative phenotype, right? So it, it's kind of a blended. Um, Two or more genes may be affecting it. You have a wide range of expression. And what's really cool is we're thinking for human skin color, there could be up to 100 or more genes involved. So it's very interesting. But polygenetic inheritance is cumulative. So it's kind of like dice, right? So if you have these dice one through six and these other dice one through six, that if you sum these up, you can see that you can get a kind of a cumulative effect. And that is somewhat similar with polygenetic in inheritance and skin color. So you can get a very a dark amount of melanin 
or you can have a very, very light amount of melanin. But most of the different combinations we see here are going to be somewhere in the middle. And so you see kind of a bell curve for these polygenetic inheritance traits, like skin color, where you would have less very dark and less very light and uh, more of medium pigmentation that you would see in a population. So pedigree analysis, you've seen this before when you were a freshman. This is a way to kind of see different um, inheritance patterns. The thing that you need to look at with pedigree analysis is you've got to look at the key, okay? Because they're all different. Mating though is always a horizontal line and offspring is a vertical line. All right, but you have to look at the key. In this particular key, a normal male is going to be um, just a blank square, and a normal female is going to be a round, blank, a round uh, shape. An affected male is going to be purple, an affected female is going to be dark, but it would depend. Okay, so here is an example with Widow's Peak. Widow's Peak is dominant. All right. And so I, I can prove that here because I have somebody with a heterozygous, um, a heterozygous uh, uh, father and a homozygous recessive mother for widow's peak. And then I can see that the offspring, I have two of the four offspring have no widow's peak but two of the offsprings, a female and a male, have a widow's peak. Here I have a male who is um, married to another female, but they are both heterozygous for widow's peak. And you can see that they would um, have, you know, uh, in this case, two daughters, one has a widow's peak and one does not. Same situation with, um, in this case, attached earlobes, okay? So attached earlobe, um, is uh, recessive to um, free earlobes, right? That you don't have that little connection. So you should be able to read a pedigree um, and that's, that's important in genetics. So a carrier is going to be an individual who is a heterozygous individual that carries that recessive gene, but is phenotypically um, normal, all right? So for an example, albinism. All right, albinism is a recessive genetic um, uh, condition where you would have two recessive traits for no pigment. And so we would say if you have um, two parents that are carriers, what are their chances of producing a child with albinism? And you can see that it's one out of four. Here is my, uh, my law of segregation. The father can give 50% of his sperm with a normal gene for pigmentation, 50% of his sperm with recessive, same thing for the mom. And so you would have a three out of four chance of producing a child with normal pigmentation, a one out of four chance of producing a child with uh, the albinism uh, pigmentation, but 50% chance of producing a child who's a carrier. Cystic fibrosis is an inherited disorder characterized by too much thick, sticky mucus. It affects breathing and it affects um, nutrient absorption. Um, it is the most common lethal genetic disease in the United States of people who are of European descent, striking one out of every 2,500 people. And so we know that you might think, well, how do we get such a horrible um, a horrible gene in our gene pool. There was an evolutionary advantage of this um, that we think had to do with some respiratory infections um, hundreds and thousands of years ago, and that's it, 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 it had a positive effect in the gene pool, and that's why it stuck around. Sickle cell anemia, we've just talked about, right? This is a defective type of hemoglobin that causes the red blood cells to be sickle-shaped, why would we get a situation? This is also um, recessive. And um, this affects one out of every 400 African Americans. Why do we have this horrible gene? Well, it actually um, has an advantage 
in an area where there is malaria because malarial parasites um, can't really infect the red blood cells of individuals that have this, um, this type of sickle cell hemoglobin. And so that's how it got into the gene pool and that's why it's, uh, that's why it's still around. Dominant inherited disorders, um, there are some of them that are lethal, but they are very rare. And some of them can arise by mutation and not being passed down. So achondroplasia is a type of dwarfism that's caused by a rare allele or a spontaneous mutation of this particular gene. Huntington's disease is another example of a dominant allele that causes a, a lethal and rare disorder. So here is the situation. Here is a cross of one individual who has a chondroplasia and one who has average height. And I can see the sperm of the dad, 50% of the sperm is going to have the gene for a chondroplasia and 50% will not. If you have an average um, height mother, then your chances of producing a child with a chondroplasia, you can see would be two out of four or 50%. There is also an effect on the uh, phenotype depending on the environmental effects. So these particular um, hydrangea bushes have the same genotype. What makes one have pink flowers and one makes one have blue flowers is the acidity uh, level of the soil. And so gardeners that like pink can do different things with the um, adding different um, uh, uh, in, in chemicals that would cause the soil to be more basic and more acidic to get these different colors. Multifactorial disorders, um, many diseases that we know of have multiple effects. Heart disease and cancer both have genetic and environmental components and we don't really know the interplay between genetic contributions and the environment, but we know that there is um, probably a very good combination of those. So let's talk a little bit about fetal testing. In the United States, birth defects uh, occur about one every 33 pregnancies. And it is very important that we know about those early. Um, for choices that parents might have to make, very painful choices that parents might have to make, or uh, preparing for a child that is going to be special needs. So we have two different ways of testing for pregnancies, um, amniocentesis and chorionic villi sampling. Other techniques that we can do um, occur uh, uh, are um, ultrasound and fetoscopy that can also be allowed to assess the fetal health. The um, chorionic villa sampling is one that you can do about 10 to 12 weeks into a pregnancy. And it would um, occur by just taking a, a healthcare provider, taking a little suction tube through the cervix and getting some of the chorionic villi, which is part of the placenta, and then taking some of the fetal cells that are in there, doing some biochemical tests. And then after several hours, you can actually produce a karyotype and that would allow you to see um, abnormalities in the numbers of the particular chromosomes. A little later in pregnancy, we can do amniocentesis. And this requires um, giving the mother some local anesthetic and taking a needle and with the help of ultrasound, um, placing that needle into the fluid that surrounds the fetus and drawing out some of that fluid that's called amniotic fluid. That's why it's called amniocentesis. And we can take some of that fluid, spin it down, get the fetal cells and do some biochemical tests to the fluid, but then we can also um, culture some of those cells and then we can make a karyotype from that. Newborn screening. So we are now, because we are learning more and more about genetic tests, um, we can do some screening to newborns and one that is done throughout the United States is for a genetic disorder called phenoketonuria or PKU.
um, and that is a recessive genetic disorder that can cause permanent and irreversible brain damage if um, phenylalanine is um, ingested by that individual. And so um, it's very important to find that out because if you then put that child on a diet that is, um, does not have that particular amino acid, then, um, then no brain damage will occur. So I just want to finish up this lecture by just suggesting that you watch the TED Talk um, on skin color, Breaking the Illusion of Skin Color by Nina Jablonski. It is absolutely fantastic. It talks about the, um, the melanin and folic acid and also talks about how um, the, um, imp the amount of UV exposure on Earth has um, been a very important um, developmental um, pressure on melanin as a protective mechanism against ultraviolet light. Um, and so it's just um, really interesting about evolution and skin color. And I, I hope that that will um, be helpful for you to watch that TED Talk if you haven't already. So that's Mendelian genetics, and I'll see you in class.